You are listening to Target Australia: Japanese submarine attacks on Sydney and Newcastle, written and narrated by Mark Felton. Episode two. This is an audio-only episode for War Stories with Mark Felton. Sunday is the traditional day of rest, and the 31st of May 1942 found both the citizens of Sydney and many members of the crews from the collection of Allied warships drawn up in the harbour, taking the day off and enjoying themselves. The cinemas, dance halls, restaurants, and brothels of Sydney were all doing a good business from seamen on shore leave. A feeling of unease, however, did permeate the fun. A feeling that the Japanese were coming to spoil the party. Nobody knew when and how the enemy may have arrived on the shores of Australia, but rumours of an imminent invasion abounded in the pubs and tea shops, the newspapers and cinema newsreels fueling the anxiety as Australians followed the progress of the Japanese advance towards their shores. The government of Prime Minister John Curtin had issued several warnings of an imminent Japanese attack on the continent since early 1942, fueled by the deteriorating Allied situation in the Far East, as the colonial powers, Commonwealth forces, and the United States faced defeat after defeat from Hong Kong to the Philippines. At the time of the Japanese midget submarine attacks on Sydney Harbour, Australia appeared isolated and in imminent danger. Darwin, Derby, and Broome in the north had all suffered heavy Japanese bombing raids. Malaya, Hong Kong, and Singapore had all fallen to the seemingly relentless Japanese war machine, and thousands of Australian servicemen had become prisoners of war, the mercy of a contemptuous enemy. New Guinea was under heavy attack as Australian troops slogged it out with the Japanese along the Kokoda Trail as the Allies sought to hold on to Port Moresby. The Battle of the Coral Sea had been a close-run thing for the United States and Australia. As Japanese submarines approached Sydney, Australians felt their backs were against the wall, a feeling already experienced by their British cousins in the late summer of 1940, as Germany had seemed poised to invade across the English Channel. On the 10th of April 1942, the Commander in Chief of the Japanese Combined Fleet had issued the following to the Sixth Fleet, ordering the submarine units: one, to reconnoitre the enemy's fleet bases in the Indian Ocean and the South Pacific; two, to destroy the enemy's maritime commerce. Three to lend support to the Port Moresby or Mo operation. Submarines were immediately dispatched along with midget submarines from the tender Choyoda, all coming under the designation Eastern Advance Detachment. The submarines I twenty two, twenty four, twenty seven, twenty eight, and twenty nine, and headed for Australia and New Zealand. The I twenty nine. Under Lieutenant Commander Juichi Izu, arrived off Sydney on the 13th of May. Three days later, he attacked his first ship. Izu intercepted a Soviet freighter, the 5,135-ton Wellen, 50 miles southeast of Newcastle, New South Wales, and launched two torpedoes at her. Both missed their target, so Izu ordered the I-29 to the surface and had his deck gun brought into action. Japan and the Soviet Union were not at war at this time, so Izu's actions were dangerous and could have caused a diplomatic row with the one power Japan was keen not to antagonize. Although three Soviet sailors were wounded, no significant damage was done to the ship, and Izu gave up and submerged. The significance of this action was the suspension of all ship movements between Sydney and Newcastle for 24 hours. While a group of Australian corvettes searched in vain for the Japanese submarine, the I-29 motored quietly back to Sydney and launched her aerial reconnaissance of the port. As a result of the I-29's aerial reconnaissance of Sydney Harbour on the 23rd of May, the Eastern Detachment Commander, Captain Hankyu Sasaki, ordered the force to begin making preparations to attack the large force of Allied warships noted to be in the harbour. 
Sasaki aboard the I-21, then engaged in reconnoitring the city of Auckland in New Zealand, sent a report of the reconnaissance mission to Admiral Komatsu, a radio transmission that was picked up and partially decoded by the joint US and Australian Navy's Fleet Radio Unit Melbourne, or FRUMEL. However, even though the Allies had broken the Japanese codes, no action was taken to stiffen the defences around Sydney. The I-29's Yokosuka floatplane was piloted by Chief Warrant Officer Susumu Ito. It had recorded a collection of warships and merchant vessels inside Sydney Harbour. Ito and his observer had seen the heavy cruisers USS Chicago and HMAS Canberra, along with the light cruisers USS Perkins and HMAS Adelaide. Other warships in the harbour included the mine layer HMAS Bungary, the armed merchant cruisers Canimbla and Westralia, and the corvettes HMAS Wyala, Bombay and Geelong. On the 29th of May, a further aerial reconnaissance by the aircraft from the I-21 revealed that the aforementioned enemy ships were still present, and the Eastern Advance Detachment was given the go-ahead by Admiral Komatsu to attack the anchorage. On this day, both Komatsu and the detachment commander, Sasaki, sent radio messages of support and encouragement to the men who would undertake the assault on Sydney. Once again, these communications were intercepted by Frumel and partly decoded. Once again, no action was taken to tighten security at the naval base in the light of obvious Japanese submarine activity close to Sydney. Aboard the Japanese submarines I-22, 24 and 27, preparations were underway for the coming mission. The midget submarines carried aboard were being prepped and the crews briefed. The Japanese were waiting for the weak autumn sun to set, the midget submarine crews completing their final rituals before setting out to attack the enemy. All six men who would take the three midgets into Sydney Harbour that night were keyed up and also reflective about their chances of returning alive. Some quietly worshipped before small Shinto shrines erected inside the larger mother submarines, following this with a farewell meal hosted by each submarine skipper. On board the I-22, the midget's navigator, Petty Officer Masao Sujuku, carefully penned a farewell letter to his brother in Japan. Part of Sujuku's letter read, When you receive this letter, you will know that I was killed in the Australian area on the 31st of May. I have nothing to regret. Today I will enter the harbour in order to strike an enemy battleship. Take care of my parents and sisters. The final time aboard the larger submarines was spent changing into clean uniforms and in performing the way of the tea ceremony. Following Shinto rites, the crewmen's bodies and souls were now clean. Clambering through the hatch connecting midget A-21 to the submarine I-22, Lieutenant Commander Ageta of the I-22 was almost reduced to tears as he bade farewell to Sub-Lieutenant Keo Matsuo and Petty Officer First Class Sujuku, both men being urged to try and regain the I-22 after completing their mission. For their part, Matsuo and Sujuku thanked Ageta for his efforts in bringing them this far and allowing them to undertake the coming mission. At 5.21pm, midget A-21 began to motor towards the eastern entrance to Sydney Harbour, the crew of the I-22 listening to their propeller sounds fading away into the night. The two crewmen of midget A-14 aboard the I-27, Lieutenant Kenshi Chuman and Petty Officer First Class Takeshi Omori, had undergone similar rituals and farewells. At 5.28pm, their midget parted company with the I-27 and set off for Sydney. Last to go was Sub-Lieutenant Katsuhisa Ban and his navigator, Petty Officer First Class Mamuro Ashibe, in midget A-24 at 5.40pm. All three midgets motored the seven miles to the harbour entrance. At 7.45pm, midget A-14 from the I-27 slowly headed at periscope depth towards the entrance to the harbour, while the other two midgets waited. The Sydney Harbour defences were not, according to the local anti-submarine officer, up to scratch. 
Acting Commander Harvey Newcomb had written to the Commodore in charge, Sydney, Commodore Gerard Muirhead Gould, warning him in January 1942 that enemy midget submarines could theoretically penetrate the harbour defences. Newcomb was a professional Royal Navy officer who had been dispatched from Britain in 1938 with orders to found an anti-submarine establishment at Edgecliff in Sydney. This facility had subsequently been named HMAS Rushcutter. In 1942, the means for detecting a submarine penetration of Sydney Harbour were in place. At the centre of the detection precautions were six electrical cables, thousands of feet in length, laid on the seabed, covering a wide expanse of the harbour approaches and entrance. Known as indicator loops, each cable would record electronically at a special shore station the passage of a ship or submarine over them. All contacts were automatically registered at the Navy facility at South Head, close to the harbour entrance. The indicator loop system protecting the harbour was backed up with an almost finished and intended to be complete anti-submarine and torpedo net boom. One section of the net and boom could be opened and closed by small tenders, allowing vessels to enter the harbour between George's Head and Green Point. There were, however, some sizeable gaps in the net where the laying had not been completed by the time the Japanese attacked. Newcomb's 20th of January letter to Commodore Muirhead Gould, who was also a Royal Navy officer, outlined concerns over efficient watchkeeping and monitoring of the indicator loop system by naval personnel at South Head. In theory, the harbour's early warning system allowed the Royal Australian Navy to combat any enemy penetration of the harbour. But of course it also presupposed that very special attention needed to be paid to every contact recorded. The Japanese midget submarine attack on Pearl Harbour in Hawaii in 1941 had, if anything, driven this point home to Newcomb. The system, however, was not functioning correctly, and crucially, the first loops would fail to alert the Australians to a submarine penetration of the harbour. On the evening of the 31st of May 1942, the three Japanese midget submarines approaching Sydney Harbour were not detected by the first stages of the indicator loop system, because parts of the system were out of action. Midget A-14 passed over several more indicator loop cables as she made for the Westgate boom and net opening. At the naval recording station at South Head, a contact was noted several times, but was dismissed as probably one of the several ferries and patrol boats moving about the harbour. This point highlights Newcomb's very real concerns over correct monitoring and recording by local naval personnel. Part of the problem was the fact that the system was unable to differentiate between different types of vessels, so it was down to the operator and his superiors to determine a likely cause of the contact. The first actual confirmed detection of a midget submarine inside the harbour, and therefore inside the defences, was by pure chance. The Australian Maritime Services maintained waterborne lookouts around the harbour entrance, entrusted to watch the gap and to make sure no one interfered with any of the equipment. Watchmen James Cargill and William Nangle were sitting in a punt when they noticed something unusual between the anti-torpedo nets and the West Channel light. Cargill said in a report to Muirhead Gould, now promoted to the rank of Rear Admiral, that We thought at first it was a fishing launch with no lights, and knowing that that was not allowed, I went in the rowing boat to investigate. Cargill rowed up alongside the unidentified craft and found it was a steel construction about four or five feet above the water, which looked like two large cylinders with iron guards around them. Cargill immediately rowed over to the patrol boat, HMAS Yarama, which was about 80 yards away and reported what he had seen to the officer commanding. When asked by the officer what he thought it was, Cargill replied, I thought it was a submarine or a mine. Because the naval officer refused to take the Yarama closer to the object, presumably for safety reasons, Cargill rowed a naval rating back over to the craft. By now the midget submarine's hull was partially visible, and the rating had no trouble in immediately identifying what it was. Lieutenant Chuman aboard the A-14 by now realised that his craft was trapped in the Australian nets. 
Two hours after Cargill had first sighted and reported an object in the nets, at 10.30 p.m., the Yarama sent the following signal to Naval Headquarters in Sydney. Object is submarine. Request permission to open fire. Another patrol boat, HMAS Lolita, came up and dropped several depth charges close to the midget that was followed by an infinitely bigger and louder detonation that woke up the entire harbour area. A booming echo ran the length of the harbour, bringing citizens to their windows and out onto the streets, where all they could see were several searchlights scanning the waters. Lieutenant Chuman and Petty Officer Omuri, realising that they were trapped in the nets and determined to avoid the disgrace of capture, had set the submarine's demolition charge, determined to kill themselves rather than face an ignominious confinement. Death had come instantly as the midget had blown itself to pieces. Rear Admiral Muirhead Gould looked now to the various ship's captains to begin moving their vessels around the harbour as an immediate anti-submarine strategy. The heavy cruiser USS Chicago, misidentified by Japanese aerial reconnaissance as the British battleship HMS Warspite, and the destroyer USS Perkins began, after a signal at 10.43pm, to take anti-submarine precautions. Sub-Lieutenant Ban in Midget A-24 had decided upon a clever strategy for entering the harbour unchallenged, in a similar fashion to Sub-Lieutenant Yokoyama on the morning of the 7th of December 1941, who had placed his midget in the wake of the repair ship USS Antares and trailed her towards the open gate in the anti-submarine net protecting the entrance to Pearl Harbour in Hawaii. Although Ban's midget A-24 showed up on the indicator loop system at 9.48pm, Ban manoeuvred his submarine behind the manly ferry that was just coming into the harbour. His target was the USS Chicago, although Ban thought the vessel was the battleship Warspite. Australian Naval Headquarters, following the two indicator loop crossings over cable number three, had finally begun to take some action. Two corvettes, HMAS Geelong and Wyala, had each received signals to move out and investigate. In the meantime, Midget A-21 and a Lieutenant Matsuo waited at the harbour heads while Ban launched his attack. Neither of the Australian warships detailed to investigate the suspicious indicator loop reports was actually ready for combat. For a start, the majority of the crews from both of the vessels were ashore on leave. The Wyala was missing her captain, who was on his farm three hours away by car and the remaining crew was unfamiliar with the new 20mm Ehrlichon cannon fitted to the vessel. The Geelong could only run on one engine, the other one being under repair, and she only had one officer and five ratings aboard. Lieutenant Harry Tyrell, the Royal Australian Naval Reserve, ordered a Vickers machine gun located aft, manned and loaded. Incredibly, Tyrell spotted Midget A-24's conning tower cutting through the water heading towards Farm Cove, where the heavy cruiser HMAS Canberra was berthed. Tyrell took an Aldous lamp and trained it on the Midget's conning tower, ordering the Vickers gunner to open fire. The rating held his fire, however, as he believed that a nearby civilian ferry was too close to his line of fire. The USS Chicago was moored close to the Canberra. Lookouts aboard the American ship also spotted the midget's conning tower and turned on their searchlights to assist the gunners who began working the ship's secondary armament. The Geelong finally joined in with bursts of Vickers fire, but the midget did not deviate too far from her course, moving towards the Sydney Harbour Bridge. The dockyard motorboat Nestor narrowly avoided colliding with the submarine. The A-24 began to submerge as the water was churned by a hail of exploding shells and machine gun bullets from vessels in the vicinity as they attempted to stop the little submarine from acquiring a target. Midget A-21 under Lieutenant Matsuo entered the harbour unnoticed as all attention and the shooting was focused on Ban's A-24 deep inside the harbour proper. At 10.54pm, HMAS Loriana, an unarmed patrol boat, managed to illuminate with her searchlight the unmistakable shape of a small submarine's conning tower cutting through the still water. 
immediately as the brilliant white beam of the searchlight flashed through Matsuo's periscope, he ordered Suzuku to dive the boat. Although the Loriana was powerless to attack the Japanese submarine, she was able to call up some reinforcements on her radio and alerted the armed patrol boat HMAS Yandra. The Yandra closed up behind the A-21 as the midget proceeded down the East Channel, the former taking six minutes to entirely close the gap between herself and the submarine till the midget disappeared beneath the forecastle. A hard impact was felt throughout the Yandra, confirming that she had successfully rammed the submarine. Lookouts reported that the submarine appeared to be submerging once the Yandra had sailed on about a hundred yards after passing over the submarine's conning tower. Midget A-21 popped back to the surface about 600 yards from the Yandra, but by the time the gun crew had organized themselves, it was found to be impossible to depress the gun sufficiently to hit the submarine. The A-21 submerged again, followed by six depth charges that rolled off the stern of the Yandra. The underwater detonations of the depth charges, each barrel's fuse having been set at a hundred feet, caused more damage to the Australian vessels than the Japanese midget, which had dived to the bottom of the harbour and was now waiting for the anti-submarine attack to come to an end. On board the Yandra, the explosions had caused the steering gear, anti-submarine gear, degaussing gear and telephone communications to aft to all fail. HMAS Loriana had been lifted clear of the water by the explosions, also causing the vessel some minor damage. Admiral Muirhead Gould now issued two orders. Firstly, he ordered that all ferry operations in the harbour should continue, hoping that the assorted vessel's movements might assist Navy efforts in preventing the midget submarines from finding targets. Busy surface traffic would hopefully keep the midgets submerged and therefore blind. Secondly, Muirhead Gould ordered the dockyard and graving dock lights immediately extinguished on the Garden Island naval base, which was lit up like the proverbial Christmas tree, providing the enemy with light to find targets with their periscopes and a useful navigation point. At 11.25pm, the dockyard was plunged suddenly into darkness. At 12.30am on the morning of the 1st of June, Ban's midget surfaced close to Bradley's head off Garden Island. Ban lined up his vessel as best he could on the now darkened anchorage and ordered Petty Officer Ashibe to fire both torpedoes. The first torpedo ran past the USS Chicago, missing the heavy cruiser and Ban's primary target by about 300 yards. It then passed beneath the Royal Netherlands Navy submarine K-9 and continued on, eventually ploughing into the harbour wall, directly beneath HMAS Cutterball. The Cutterball was a former ferry being used as a Navy accommodation ship, and the detonation of the Japanese torpedo beneath her was catastrophic. The vessel was lifted from the water, almost breaking in two, as an enormous fountain of spray and debris plumed into the air over the stricken ship. The detonations smashed windows in surrounding houses, knocked out the lights at naval headquarters, and shook buildings to their foundations. Most of the sailors aboard the Cutterball were in hammocks, which proved to be almost impossible to get out of as the ship twisted into the air and then sank rapidly into the harbour. Nineteen sailors were killed by the torpedo or drowned in their hammocks, and another seaman died later in hospital. Many others were injured or left in a state of shock from their ordeal. The Dutch submarine K-9 was also badly damaged in the attack, although none of her crew received injuries. Ban's second torpedo tore past the USS Perkins, just missed the Chicago, and then ran into the foreshore but did not explode. Lieutenant Tyrell from HMAS Geelong was ashore when the Cutterball was sunk and saw the beach Japanese torpedo as he rushed back to his vessel with new orders, the torpedo's propellers still running at full speed on the small beach, with a fluid leaking ominously out of the casing. Many civilians believed that a Japanese invasion of Sydney was underway, the explosion of Ban's torpedo being so tremendous, and coming after the equally impressive self-destruction of Chuman's A-14 on the nets. 
The harbour was also ablaze with machine gun and tracer fire and numerous detonations, as Allied naval vessels, from heavy cruisers to small patrol boats, shut up anything resembling a midget submarine. As the morning progressed, the Navy started to recover from the initial shock of being under attack, and to organise a hunt for the two remaining Japanese submarines that were lurking in the harbour somewhere. It would be a hunt to their destruction. HMAS Wayala was ordered to leave Sydney Harbour and seek out the larger Japanese mother submarines that were assumed to be close by, awaiting the return of the midgets. An aerial search was also mounted in the hope of locating these submarines and destroying them. Just after 2 a.m., the Chicago and the Perkins moved out to sea. Less than an hour later, as the Chicago was passing the northern tip of South Head, a submarine periscope was spotted almost alongside the heavy cruiser. The warship's guns would not depress sufficiently to engage the submarine, but the sighting was reported to Admiral Muirhead Gould. This midget was the A-21 under Lieutenant Matsuo that had survived the ramming and depth charge attacks of the Yandra four hours earlier. Due to mechanical failure, neither of the midget's torpedoes could be fired, so it is surmised that Matsuo attempted to use the A-21 as one giant torpedo and ram his boat into the Chicago in the hope of detonating the torpedoes and killing himself and his crewmen in true kamikaze style. For several hours, Australian patrol vessels reported contacts with submarines everywhere, and depth charges were dropped all over the harbour. Midget A-21 was eventually sunk by depth charges at 5am in Taylor Bay by HMAS Yarama, assisted by HMAS Steady Hour and Sea Mist. The midget submarine was later discovered on the harbour floor with its engines still running. Matsuo and Suzuku had both shot themselves. Sub-Lieutenant Ban and the A-24 were never seen again, or well, that is until the 21st century, when the wreck of the boat was finally discovered. In November 2006, divers located the wreck sitting upright in 180 feet of water, three miles off Bungan Head, of Sydney's northern beaches. The wreck had several bullet holes in it, likely from the USS Chicago. The site is today a protected war grave, and is also protected by surveillance cameras mounted on buoys and a sonar listening device to prevent interference. Perhaps aware that attempting to reach any of the mother submarines could have drawn Australian anti-submarine forces down on them, it has been surmised that Ban scuttled his boat, killing himself and petty officer Ashibe. Bodies of Lieutenants Chuman and Matsuo and petty officers Omori and Suzuku were recovered from midgets A-14 and A-21 respectively. Their bodies were taken ashore to a civilian funeral director's and prepared for cremation. On the 9th of June, cremation of the Japanese sailors was duly conducted at the eastern suburbs crematorium with full military honours. Chief among the dignitaries who attended the funeral service was Rear Admiral Muirhead Gould, who was to come under great criticism from the Australian public for granting the enemy such an honour while largely ignoring the deaths of 20 Australian and British sailors from HMAS Cutterball. In response, Muirhead Gould replied, Should we not accord full honours to such brave men as these? It must take courage of the very highest order to go out in a thing like that steel coffin. However, the entire affair was to leave a bad taste in the Australian public's mouth, compounded by the fact that Muirhead Gould was not even an Australian. In Japan, the six dead submariners were immediately elevated to the status of war gods, and the ashes of the cremated men were returned to Tokyo by Australia. The remains of the two midget submarines raised from the harbour bed, A-14, which was wrecked by the demolition charge, and A-21, which had suffered some damage during depth charging, would go on to serve as a useful propaganda tool for Australia. From the two damaged midgets, one complete example was reconstructed and toured rural New South Wales, Victoria and South Australia, raising funds for the war effort. Eventually, the composite submarine was delivered to the Australian War Memorial in Canberra in 1943, where it remains on display today. 
Incredibly, after all the efforts of both service personnel and civilians in foiling the Japanese attack on Sydney Harbour, not a single bravery or meritorious service award was made to any of the participants, even though many recommendations were submitted. Muirhead Gould even went so far as to criticise watchman James Cargill, who had first spotted midget A-14 caught in the anti-torpedo net, commenting that he was too slow in alerting the authorities in his discovery. In the end, it was only the two watchmen, Cargill and William Nangle, who received an award, both men receiving paltry sums of money. As the citizens of Sydney digested the impact of the midget submarine attacks in the days following the raid, tensions remained high. Although the Royal Australian Navy and city authorities could correctly claim that the Japanese raid had been a failure, resulting in the known destruction of two of the raiders' crafts, people nonetheless realised that Sydney had had a close brush with disaster. Commander Newcomb's January warning to Muirhead Gould regarding the correct monitoring of the indicator loops had proved prophetic, as all of the midget submarines had passed unnoticed over Sydney's early warning system until well inside the harbour. The Japanese had also been able to conduct an unchallenged aerial reconnaissance mission over the harbour before the attack in the Yokosuka E-14Y1 floatplane piloted by Chief Warrant Officer Fujita from the submarine I-25, and it was really only pure luck that had prevented a significant warship such as the USS Chicago from being torpedoed. The death of 20 sailors aboard HMAS Cutterball was serious enough, especially as it occurred deep inside a well-defended friendly harbour and the death toll among Allied sailors would undoubtedly have been more severe had not Lieutenant Matsuo's torpedo tubes malfunctioned. Sydney Harbour, even with an electronic early warning system in place and mostly functioning, had been penetrated with relative ease by three Japanese midget submarines that were crewed by suicidally determined and brave young submariners, none of whom returned from their mission. Off Sydney, the five Japanese I-class submarines that had participated in the attack, three of which had actually launched midgets, remained on station for several days, hoping that at least one of the midgets would attempt a rendezvous. Their captains eventually realised that all three submarines had been lost, and the five larger boats moved off to begin a successful campaign of interdicting merchant shipping along the Australian coast. Tune in next time as the big Japanese submarines launch a campaign along the coast and also launch a second attack on the city of Sydney. You have been listening to Target Australia, Japanese submarine attacks on Sydney and Newcastle, written and narrated by Dr. Mark Felton. For a wide variety of military history videos, please visit my other YouTube channel, Mark Felton Productions. You can also help to support both of my channels at PayPal and Patreon. Details in the description box below.